Good morning. Welcome to Reformed Presbyterian Church. We're really glad that you're here with us today. Um, when you open your bulletin, the very first line says, Reformed Presbyterian Church exists to be a stream of God's refreshing grace for, pe for people from all walks of life. It's there every Sunday. It's been there for many years, and sometimes it can just become part of the landscape. But when you think about it, that is a heavy statement, and it's worth contemplating and thinking about all the ramifications of being God's refreshing grace to people from all walks of life, not just people that we approve of. So think about that and uh, be challenged by it. Uh, don't be discouraged by it. Uh, as well, you know, we want people to come in and experience that, but we also want to go into our homes and be a stream of refreshing grace in our homes and in our place of work and in our neighborhoods. And if we aren't, then we're probably indistinguishable from the world, and that happens. So let's find some encouragement and approach God through Psalm 37. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth the righteousness of the Let's pray together. Father, we come to you now and ask that you would enlighten the eyes of our hearts so that we may know more deeply the hope to which you have called us. And we pray also that Christ, who is our hope, would be seen more clearly in us by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.
remain standing as we confess our sin together. Let's do this in unison. O oh Lord, you who are merciful, take away my sins from me and enkindle within me the fire of your Holy Spirit. Take away this heart of stone from me and give me a heart of flesh, blood, a heart of love and joy, a heart which may delight in you, love you, and please you. For Christ's sake, amen.
we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lived, he lives to God. So you also, you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God and Jesus Christ. Children are now dismissed for children's worship, uh, all those from four years old to first grade. And while they are being dismissed, you may uh, shake a neighbor's hand and wish them a happy St. Patrick's Day.
at RPC. If uh, you're visiting for the first time, uh, please stop by the Visitor Center in the Narthex. On your way out, we have a, a gift for you uh, to express our appreciation for your visit today. And also the ushers are bringing down the uh, registration pads. We really appreciate knowing that you're here. It's a great help to us in, in many ways. But especially for first time visitors, we're so glad you're here. And for a time of prayer, I'm sure it, it hasn't been lost on you that, can you believe that it's four years ago this week that everything shut down? Aren't you glad we're through that? And you know, we, we do remember, we see that as God promised that all things work together for good. We know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love him, those who are called according to his purpose. And, and may that be a reminder uh, to us that he sees us through pandemics and he sees us through what we're walking through right now. So let's join our hearts together in prayer. Almighty God, we are grateful that you are our God. We come humbly before you today, filled with thanksgiving for all the gifts you have given to us. The gift of your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who came and was born and lived and died and rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven. Whoever lives to intercede for us, how we thank you so much for this indescribable gift. And we thank you, Father, that through him, we come in his name, Lord, to bring our requests before you. And we thank you for the fact that you have promised to work all things for good to those who love you and are called according to your purpose. Father, we know that we don't always see that good in this life, but we hang on to that promise, Lord. And we ask uh, that you would continue to ground us in your word, a foundation that cannot be shaken And so we look to you, O oh Lord, today for, for your help in our time of need. We praise you once again, Lord, for the gift of uh, Nathaniel Labs to uh, Jeremy and Janelle. And we, we pray for the um, efforts here at RPC to help support uh, the costs of that adoption, Lord. We know that you will supply according to for all of our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus and we pray that you would do that. We also thank you Father for uh, Dr. Kiefer and his wife Marty and for their children and we pray that uh, in these weeks uh, leading up to uh, his visit with us in April that you would be working in, in their hearts and working in our hearts Lord continue to confirm uh, your calling on, on this godly man to serve here at RPC. And Lord, we pray this morning as well for uh, David Voss. We pray for David and Rachel again for uh, continuing wisdom for them, Lord, as they're considering treatment, surgery for David. We know this is a difficult decision. We pray that you would, would help them, Lord, in consultation with their doctors. Father, we are also grateful this morning that uh, Fred and Chris Thomas' grandson is doing much better now after a, uh, a grave threat from bacterial meningitis. Thank you. Thank you that, uh, that he's doing better. We ask for others, Lord, who are facing different challenges, whether they are physical or emotional or spiritual, Lord, we thank you that you are our burden bearer. Thank you that you are the one who uh, is always with us, who never leaves us nor forsakes us. And we do thank you for your word and thank you for Anthony who will be preaching this morning. Please bless him as he ministers uh, your word to us. And we pray as well that you would be honored by the offerings we received this morning, thanking you that we can never adequately express our gratitude for all that you've given to us. We pray that you would receive these gifts uh, as a gift of thanksgiving back to you. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. It is a joy to be with you this morning. Uh, as you know, we are in our series in the Psalms. If you've been here with us before, uh, we've been looking at uh, various Psalms. There are 150 to choose from, and we're not doing all of them. So this is maybe the greatest hits. Uh, and we've been asking some of you for a favorite Psalm and for why it's a favorite Psalm. And this, this week's Psalm is from, uh, is actually Psalm 1, and it's, it was chosen by David Voss. And uh, I'll read his comments on it very quickly, and then we'll uh, read it together uh, responsively as we've been doing. Uh, David says uh, that Psalm 1 is not only the first Psalm, but in agreement with Spurgeon, which is a good guy to agree with, it sets the stage for the whole book of Psalms. It defines the godly and ungodly man. The godly man eschews unrighteousness and meditates on the word of God day and night, while the ungodly man is like chaff which wind drives away. Let's now read the psalm responsibly. It's in your bulletin as well. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, who stands in the way of sinners, or sits in the ski of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. On his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you give us uh, open ears this morning to hear from your word. Uh, help us to be challenged and encouraged uh, of the goodness of your way to reject the way of the ungodly and to follow the way that you have laid before us and shown us in your son, Jesus. Amen. So uh, David's outline is a great brief overview. I could, I could almost sit down, but I won't. I'll continue. Uh, but I think it's interesting to think about why Psalm 1 was chosen as the first psalm. Think about how Proverbs begins. In the first, the opening few verses, you actually find out what the point of the book of Proverbs is. Uh, chapter 1, verse 7 says, and this should sound familiar, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And that's kind of like the, you know, the thesis statement or the, the main idea of the book of Proverbs. And the book of Proverbs unpacks that in various ways throughout the book, and obviously other themes are in there too, but that's kind of the main driving theme. And in much the same way, uh, the argument is, is that Psalm 1 really kind of is this opening uh, grand overview of the entire book of, of Psalms. Uh, it's going to contrast the righteous and the wicked. This is, if you will, the opening track or the title track of an album. This is... This is, this is important to get the right song stuck in your head. And this is the song that's supposed to be kind of earworming our way into our heads that we're, we're thinking about over and over again. And the reason for that is because there are two songs. There are two ways. There's the way of the tree and the way of chaff. And only one will stand in the day of judgment. So the key is to get the right song stuck in your head and to meditate on it or you're going to be led astray. I have a dumb <laughs> example of this. Uh, when a few years ago, we used to mow a cemetery in lovely Terry Hill, and the name of it was the name of a saint, and this is a saint's day as well. Today is St. Patrick's Day, and I see many of you got the memo. I see quite a bit of, or uh, quite a bit of green and a tiny bit of orange, uh, but mostly green, and this is, <laughs> this is all I got for green. But... Um, I have a green work shirt, but it's a t-shirt and it's dirty, so that probably wouldn't fly. Uh, back to the saints. I, there's this, this cemetery that we used to mow 
had the name of a saint. And I could never remember what it was called. And the reason was, is because I had a song stuck in my head from a band I like called the Cold War Kids. And they had a song on one of their early albums called St. John, Old St. John on Death Row. And it just, it was earwormy. It would get stuck in my head. And every time I would think about the cemetery, I would call it, and still do call it, St. John. But it's not St. John. It's St. Paul. And I can never, ever remember that it's St. Paul because I have the wrong song stuck in my head. And I got the wrong lyrics. And I keep trying to be like, oh, what's it? Is it from that song? St. John, right? And my coworkers are beyond frustrated with me because we're talking dozens of times. So the point of this morning is to get the right song stuck in your head, not to go the way of the wicked, but the the way of the righteous. So what's our opening, our opening phrase? What starts off really the entire book of Psalms? The first phrase in the first Psalm is blessed is the man. And there's actually the, the way the Hebrews constructed, you could almost say it as a emphatic statement. And blessed is actually plural. So you could say, oh, the blessednesses of the man. So this is a, this is a, uh, imploring you and exalting the wonders, the happiness of this option. Happiness is possible, given by grace. I think in an anxious age that we live in, that alone is good news. Blessedness is possible. John Calvin in his commentaries over and over again uses the word happiness, but he means it in that full orb sense. Not like happy that my team won the sports ball competition, but happy in that deep and abiding way. Think about how Jesus opens his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. He begins it with the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Likewise, Psalm 1, we see, a blessed man. But it's interesting. It starts out with what he doesn't do and what he does do. And I think it's interesting that the negative is actually shown first. The beginning of the blessing is to actually understand the antithesis. It's to understand the opposite, that there is a wrong way and a right way. There is black and there is white. There is up and there's down. There is no blurriness with this. There's no subtlety of the serpent that says, did God really say? The psalmist is trying to strike a sharp contrast between these two ways. And so he shows the negative first. This sets before us the pattern of the man who fears God. And he fears him by rejecting sin. He doesn't go down a certain road that he could go down. So what does it say? It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Some commentators actually see sort of a progression of sin here in this walking, standing, and then sitting. The idea is that when you're walking with the counsel of the wicked, you're just, you know, you just happen to be together right now, but surely, you know, your roads will diverge and you'll take the other path eventually. But for now, this is fine. It'll be, it'll be okay. What could, what could go wrong? But then the second, the second aspect is the standing in the way. This is more kind of waiting around for them to show up. Like, you know, you know, that, that person or that temptation is going to pass by. And so you just linger a bit. You're waiting for them to show up. You're standing in the way of sinners. And finally, you see a sitting down. Resting in this particular vice or sin or in this bad company that corrupts good morals. It's fully identifying now with the scoffer. Think about who's being talked about here, the wicked, sinners, and scoffers. These are people who deliberately scoff at God and at his law. 
they knowingly or unknowingly have joined in the rebellion of the serpent. This might make us a little comfortable, but I want to read what Calvin says. He says, the psalmist teaches us how impossible it is for anyone to apply his mind to the meditation upon God's law who has not first withdrawn and separated himself from the society of the ungodly. The first step to living well is to renounce the company of the ungodly. Otherwise, it is sure to infect us with its own pollution. I think so much of of the modern deconstruction movement that we're hearing about uh, in our wider society is frankly because of this very reason, that people are not willing to separate from, from bad teaching for fear of offending someone, for fear of, of looking, frankly, uncool, being on the outs in, in our society. We don't want to be seen as those intolerant Christians. But James 4.4 4 also tells us, do you not know that friendship with the world, with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. This is, this is walking down that road where friendship with the world, with the scoffers who do not believe in God's law and who mock it and criticize it, it inevitably will infect your life. If your closest friends are scoffers, I can tell you your future. Now, there's an important distinction. Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners, right? But he was, he was not afraid to be around these people, and that's not what this psalm is saying. But think about the nature of the relationship that Jesus had. They came to him, and this is how Jesus described it, like sick, the sick in need of a physician, they're not mocking with a high hand and Jesus is like, this is my buddy and let's all hang out for, for here on out. He could handle the rejection of sinners, whether they were, <laughs> whether they were to the right or the left, whether they were the, the Roman pagans or the self-righteous Pharisees. And the reason he could do that is because he did not need their approval to feel loved by his father. The love of his father was the thing that drove him. Obedience to his father's word is what animated his life. He sought to please him first. Jesus was also clear. There are only two ways. He said it in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it, enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. You can't choose both. Jesus said so. If you think you can choose both, you've already chosen the wide road. Now, what... What is the second option? (laughs) It's a life of delight. It's verse two. The psalmist says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. This is a theme all throughout the Psalms. We've mentioned Psalm 119 in fear and trepidation because it's so long. But if you look at it, Psalm 119, just about every single verse of Psalm 119 is that psalmist just glorying in, it, in the greatness and the goodness of God's law. Verse 97, he can't control himself. He says, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. This is the positive aspect. It's loving and desiring and meditating day and night on God's law. It actually reminds me of Deuteronomy chapter six, where you have the greatest commandment, but then it also has something following right after. So let me read that real quick. Deuteronomy chapter six, verses four through seven. First, we get that greatest commandment, which is, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart and you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk to them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. Doesn't that sound like the, the polar opposite of verse 1, where you're 
sitting with the scoffer and walking. Here instead, you're sitting and walking in the way of God and his commandments, the greatest of which is to love him with with everything you've got. That leads to an obvious problem. How can you delight in a law that you know you can't keep perfectly? Galatians 3.10 even tells us, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. Go ahead and try. Try really hard for a week to perfectly follow God's law. For a day to perfectly follow God's law. How can you delight in something that you fail at? I don't delight in playing baseball because I'm not any good at it. <laughs> I, I can't hit the broadside of a barn. Uh, I think I'd like stealing bases just because it sounds slightly naughty. Um, but I can't hit the ball, so I can never get on base to do that. So I'm not really a baseball fan because I fail at the most important part, which is hitting the ball. How are we supposed to take deep delight in the law if we are failures at the law? Only because Jesus Christ has fulfilled the law for us. He has taken away the just penalty through his death on the cross. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. This is actually Galatians uh, 3.13. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Now we are dead to sin and alive to Christ. Now we can have joy because he has fulfilled the law. He's done it and we're in him. Now the law does not condemn us because we are in Christ. He has fulfilled that law. The just penalty has been paid in his death and resurrection. Now, instead, we are encouraged to follow Christ, who perfectly obeyed the law. Now the law points to the perfect righteousness of Christ. Only in Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, which he has sent, Can we delight in God's perfect law? Because now the law is pointing to the life of Christ. We see the law fleshed out in day-to-day life. We see what it looks like in the Gospels, that the law is perfectly followed. It's in the life of Jesus. We see him do it, and then he calls us to follow him and do it too. Are we going to do it perfectly? Absolutely not but we have forgiveness. So the law no longer condemns. It should inspire us to greater heights. It is the the grand adventure, this adventure of obedience, following after our Lord. We can see that adventure in Jesus' obedience. Think about his life. How does John sum up his gospel? Talking about all all the wild things that happened to Jesus. He says, now there are many other things that Jesus did. Were I to write every one of them, I suppose the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. That is not a boring, drab, depressing life, but an adventure of a life. And we get to joyfully emulate him. But we don't do it under our own power. Jesus promises to help us. And this reminds me of uh, one of David Voss's favorite verses. And apparently, Dave Kiefer's favorite verse, because it's on his bulletin insert, and that is John 15, verses 4 and 5. It says, abide in me. This is Jesus talking to us. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus sounds a little bit like verse 3 of Psalm 1. Talking about the type of person that follows God's law, that abides in Christ, in the life of Christ. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. So we are to be like a tree. And I, that excites me because I love trees. 
<laughs> a branch on the vine is like a tree by the river. A branch on the vine of John 15 is like a tree by the river in verse 3 of Psalm 1. Did you hear what it said? A tree is planted. It's like branches being grafted in. A tree is planted. One commentator says, trees do not gallop across the landscape looking for a good spot to rest. Trees are planted. We are planted. And if we have been planted by the river, then we should rejoice, just like in Psalm 16, verse 5 and 6, where the psalmist says, The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. So what are a handful of the characteristics of a tree that we see in Scripture? One, trees apparently sometimes are happy. (laughs) And I get that from Isaiah 55, verse 12. This sounds like I'm talking about Ents from Lord of the Rings, but I'm not. It's in Isaiah. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. The trees themselves rejoice in the salvation of their God. Trees are a blessing. We live in a land where trees are plentiful, so we sometimes may forget there are many blessings. Uh, I deal with trees pretty regularly in my job as a landscaper. Uh, Just in day-to-day normal life, they provide shade and cool. They protect your house from that extreme heat. If you have one that, you know, blocks the windows so the heat doesn't just lay in uh, into your house. It can actually lower your uh, air conditioning bills if you have trees planted at the right places. Lo and behold, trees can also, if you have evergreen trees and you plant them, especially, you know, north, northwestern part of your property, they can block winter wind too and make your house warmer in the winter, cooler in the summer, warmer in the winter. They can, trees can save you money in the long run. Trees make your streets and parking lots less miserable. They reduce air pollution. They tie up pollution. They turn pollution into tree branches, which is awesome. They are a habitat for any number of animals. We build tons of stuff out of trees. I actually just helped uh, my dad was, I was helping my dad build a pantry for my house. Uh, He did most of the work (laughs) and we got a free pantry. It was very nice. But it was built out of uh, some old wooden shutters that had to be at least 100 years old. Uh, We like them because there's a bullet hole in one of them which I just imagine some sort of Wild West thing where they slam the shutters shut and some guy's shooting through it. I don't know what happened. But these old shutters, 100 years old, now they're in a brand new pantry in our our kitchen. But once upon a time, that pantry, that wooden shutter, was a tree. Once upon a time, that tree was a seed. Trees are miraculous. It's a seed... Dirt, air, water, sunlight, and time, and you can build a house out of it. That's wild. That's wild that that's the kind of world that we live in. There are trees in the Garden of Eden. There are trees in the new heavens and new earth. And we are told that we are blessed. We are to be like a tree if we delight in God's word. Think about the the tree-ish language in the Bible. I'll run down just through a couple of of the low-hanging fruit, if you will. Uh, Ephesians 3.17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may understand the height and breadth of God's love. How about Colossians 2, 6 and 7? Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Or how about Jeremiah 17, 8, which sounds very much like Psalm 1. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green. It is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Trees are rooted. Are we rooted in the word of God? 
Are we established there? And then as Jeremiah said, and as Psalm 1 says, we bear fruit. Again, back to John 15, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Think of the parable of the sower and the seeds. The seeds that are scattered on good soil are abundant. They yield a hundredfold or 60 or 30. They are fruitful. What about Galatians 5? The songs we have our kids memorize. The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. But fruit is not exclusively spiritual. What are we commanded in the Garden of Eden? Be fruitful and multiply. We have a church full of kids. We're fruitful. That's great. They're covenant children. What a blessing that we've been physically fruitful, that there's children. You realize that we live in a world where birth rates are plummeting and we're commanded to be fruitful. Then it says, at the end of that verse, whatever he does, he prospers. And all that he does, he prospers. All right, well, what does that mean? <laughs> there's two, there's two uh, errors that we could fall into there. Prospers, everything he does, prosperity, health, wealth, and prosperity. That's the new gospel. God's a vending machine. We just beep, beep, beep. And he spits out the blessings in our timing and in our way. We never get sick. Everything goes great until it inevitably doesn't. And that way of, of looking at the, at the world and looking at God is shown to be uh, faulty. There are difficult times that come along. So then how do we, how do we uh, overcompensate the other way? We say, well, 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 it's spiritual blessings. Yes, of course it's spiritual blessings. Absolutely it is spiritual blessings. But we're not merely blessed when we get to heaven and God's just just raining haymakers on us the entire time until then. What are we told in, in Hebrews 11 verse 6? Without faith it is impossible to please him for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Hebrews 11 goes on to describe all the ways that God helped Abraham and Moses and all the other faithful Old Testament saints. God is not hesitant to bless you. It's ironic to think that God, to, to try to move all of God's blessings purely and only into the spiritual realm when we live in Lancaster County, of all places in the world. This is the most fruitful, non-irrigated county in the United States, which is the most prosperous country in the entire world. And we try to find a way to act like that's not a blessing. That's a blessing from God that we should be thankful for. We did not deserve it. We did not earn it by our hard work, but it was a blessing. It was good. Our nation is incredibly blessed, and we should be thankful to God for it and not take it for granted or act like it was only through our own hands that we have done all this. God's law has instructed us, and that has benefited us greatly. God's mercy has been upon us in many ways. And we should not take that for granted. But the blessings are first spiritual. They are. That is foundational. You can be rich and wealthy and, and loving the great Lancaster County soil all you want, but if you reject Christ in the end, you will not stand in judgment. That's what the psalm says. The blessings are spiritual. They are both, but they are first spiritual. Calvin says, whatever may befall them is conducive to their salvation. Sometimes the blessings look like difficulty. Sometimes they are, in fact, difficulty. This psalm, remember, this psalm is the introduction to the book of Psalms. The psalmist knows that Psalm 37 that we just looked at last week is coming, that the wicked sure look like they're winning right now. The psalmist knows that Psalm 88, that doesn't even have a happy ending, that we looked at just a couple weeks ago, is also coming. That lament is there. There's there are a place for all of those things. But ultimately, those who delight in the Lord 
will be blessed. Even Job, for all of his suffering, which most of the book of Job is about his suffering and, and all the difficulty he deals with, in the end, God does bless him. He restores to him all that he lost. We might not get that restoration on this side of eternity, but we will get it if we're in Christ. We will be blessed in the end. Now think about the, the other road, the other song, verses four through six. The song of the chaff instead of the song of the tree. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. What of the wicked? Trees they are not. They are chaff. Chaff, if you don't know, is the leftover when threshing grain. It's actually like the outside of the grain kernel that you need to get rid of so you can, when you're harvesting grain. And it blows away in the wind. They would actually, uh, in Old Testament times, they would thresh on top of a hill so that when you were threshing, the lighter, the, the grain that you wanted fell down and the, the chaff would blow away which means less cleanup, which is nice. But think of, the, think of that contrast. Is chaff rooted by the river? No, it's in the wind. Think of, think of our society and what it, what it lauds and what it, what it promotes. It promotes rootlessness. Our, our bigwigs jet around to different tropical locations, but they, you know, they own seven homes and are hardly ever in any of them We have digital nomads that spend all their time on the internet when they need to get out and touch grass, as the kids say. Uh, Our society is rootless. Consumer culture, single serving, live in a hotel. Influencers are not telling you how great it is living on a 10th generation farm, not generally. Impermanence is the order of the day. Transience. Fruitfulness is not lauded. I just mentioned. We, I remember all through growing up years, it was like the, the population is increasing so much, the world's not going to be able to sustain it, and it, the whole world's going to be overpopulated, and it's going to ruin everything. And now, now all the experts in their wisdom are saying uh, the birth rates are plummeting, and we our economies are going to co- collapse because no one's having children. Why won't you have kids? Why won't anyone have children? And uh, South Korea and Japan and China have, they're way below pl- replacement rates. Their, their physical populations are beginning to drop, and they're, it's a cliff. They have a lot of old people and no young people. I've, I don't have that, the stat on it, but it was an obnoxious number of uh, each grandchild will have a ton of grandparents, but hardly any grandparents will actually have grandchildren in China in the coming years. Most of them will be without any grandchildren to speak of anywhere. They do not have, well, a lot of them don't have churches, and that's why they don't have kids, because we're commanded to be fruitful, and it does bear out in real life. If your way of life is telling you to pursue your own individual pleasure, and you listen you will not be fruitful, you will not grow, and there will not be generations coming after you to worship the Lord. They're too busy living their own dreams. So why does the psalmist tell us that the way of the wicked is like chaff? Because he knows it doesn't always feel that way. The people that seem like they're living on top of the world right now generally are not following Christ closely. That's not what's being broadcast to us through our TVs. What does it look like instead? It looks like Psalm 37, which we looked at last uh, week, where we're told to wait for the Lord and keep his way, and he will exalt you to inherit the land. You will look on when the wicked are cut off. Verse 35, I have seen the wicked, ruthless man spreading himself like a green laurel tree. So he looks like a tree, But verse 36 says, but he passed away and behold, he was no more. Though I sought him, he could not be found. The difficulty is, is that we aren't actually trees walking around. And then we're running into people that are chaff blowing around. It's a little harder to tell. Sometimes the chaff look like they're doing pretty good. And we can look like we're having a rough go of it. And the psalmist is reminding us to look at it with spiritual eyes. To see that God is 
caring for his people, and in the long run, he provides for them. Evil can look strong and imposing like an evergreen tree, but they are, in fact, imposters. At the judgment, the chaff, the weeds in the, in the one uh, proverb are thrown into the fire. They do not stand in the day of judgment. They appeared to stand in the way of sinners in verse 1, but they do not. They do not stand in the congregation of the righteous. And that should be our desire, to join the congregation of the righteous. That makes me think of, again, Hebrews, that great cloud of witnesses, the congregation of the righteous, the heavenly choir. Sinners will not be there. And this is why partial obedience is not enough. We won't be there unless someone pays it for us. Too often we do walk in the counsel of the wicked. To be a blessed tree, we needed one to hang on a cursed tree, like we sang this morning. Galatians 3.13 said, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Chaff is dead. It's not even a seed. It can't become a tree. It is a husk. If sinners like us have any chance of being planted and of becoming a blessed, fruitful, evergreen tree, we need a fundamental change. We need to become a different kind of thing, from something dead to someone alive. It takes a supernatural work. It takes the blood of Christ. And Jesus told us, blessed are the poor in spirit. You can only be blessed if you see your deep need for Jesus. The one who died to make you alive must be your king and your savior. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Unless you are known by the only one who can save you, you will perish. If you have not called on the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, what are you waiting for? Let today be that day. Calvin says, a happy life depends on a good conscience. And your conscience can be clear only if it's washed in the blood of the Lamb. Thinking back on being planted like a tree that's blessed in his way, I'm calling that the adventure of obedience. And we already looked at how Jesus models that adventure. But think think through Hebrews 11. Abraham is... uh, He's obeyed, actually I'll read verse uh, 8 of uh, Hebrews, Hebrews 11. Abraham obeyed when he was called to go to a place that he was to receive as inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going, but by faith he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land. Think about the lives of Moses and David. These are adventurous lives to say the very least. Think about what Moses and David and Abraham went through in their lives. But who, who better to say of the Old Testament saints, they delighted in the law of the Lord. That didn't mean their lives were easy by any stretch. Today is St. Patrick's Day. His life wasn't easy either. But we remember him because of his adventure of obedience. He was, I don't know how much you know about St. Patrick. He wasn't a brewer of green beer. He was a saint. Uh, He was from like the the 400s. He's an early early church uh, saint, taken as a slave. He was an English child, grew up in a kind of anomaly. He was grew up in a Christian household, but he it didn't really take for him. And then he was captured by pirates and taken as a slave to Ireland. And there he was worked as a slave for seven years, and there. His faith took root. He prayed nearly continuously as a shepherd out in the out in the wilds, out in the wind, and he was able to escape. Think about what you might want to do if you escaped awful pagan slave masters and finally got a chance to get out of Dodge, get out of there. You could have sworn to never have anything to do with those people ever again. If you were really uh, vindictive, you'd get your own ship and go back and take your own slaves and teach them who's boss. Patrick didn't do any of those things. Instead of taking vengeance, 
he went back and really defeated his enemy by converting him and having become brothers and sisters in Christ. He went back as a missionary to reach the lost, to reach a whole nation of pagans for the gospel. And he also providentially saved the West. There's a, there's a whole book about how the Irish saved civilization. Their monasteries saved manuscripts while, while the Western Roman Empire was burning to the grand, ground and being sacked by the Vandals. Up there in the far-flung corner of Ireland, there's a bunch of monks scurrying around, copying down manuscripts and preserving a, a strong Christian way of life that eventually in centuries to follow would turn into massive missionary movements by Irish and English missionaries into Northern uh, Europe. They converted a, a continent over time, slowly but surely, like a tree growing. His leaf did not wither, and all he did, he prospered, but it probably wasn't always pretty. We still know the name of a slave boy, Patrick, of all people, because of his adventure of obedience. The Lord knew his way, and today he is among that congregation of the saints. St. Patrick's breastplate is a famous prayer of his. Uh, It depends on what version you read. I'm going to read a little bit of the end of it to remind us of what drove Patrick. And I know he probably didn't write it, but it's still really good. Christ with me, Christ behind me, Christ within me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ at my right, Christ at my left. This is how the prayer ends. It's quite a bit longer. Salvation is the Lord's. Salvation is Christ's. May thy salvation, Lord, be always with us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your salvation, the salvation you gave to us in Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, the one who lived the perfect life and yet suffered like the wicked, like the wicked that we are and have been so that he could make us righteous in your sight, that we may now walk in the way of righteousness and be blessed. Help us to be like a tree, to clap our hands with joy at what you've done, to be rooted in your word and to be fruitful both spiritually and physically in all the ways that you've gifted us and called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
receive these words. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Amen. Please be seated. We have a few announcements. Uh, the children are dismissed to the music room. Uh, first, I'll invite Joe and Tarante to come up and give a verbal announcement about Dave Kiefer that you can probably follow along with your bulletin insert. Good morning. In case you didn't notice, there's an insert in your bulletin, a picture of David and Marty and their five adopted children. Fantastic. Um, you can see the timeline of the events, but I just wanted to let you know that as a search committee, after looking at 40 candidates, we unanimously chose David Kiefer. If you remember about 18 months ago, we did a church survey to find out what's important to this congregation. And we got the results of the survey lined up really well with the committee. We were all on the same page. Then fast forward to the, um, the Flourish report, and the Flourish report gave us some about four areas of opportunities for improvement, if we can call it that. As we looked at David's strengths and the areas that he's interested in, perfect lineup. So we're really excited and really blessed. Um, looking forward to this. Now, April 20th will be a time from 1 to 4 o'clock. You can see that to meet and greet with David and his family. There'll be some refreshments. On the 21st, he'll be preaching. Uh, the, the congregational meeting afterwards will be for you to approve the terms of call, which is a salary package, vacation time, and all that, because that's up to you to say yes or no. Um, so the terms of call and, and whether or not you want to call David as our pastor. He does have obligations in his current ministry that will take him out of the country that he can't hand off to someone else and in a short time of uh, vacation afterwards. So rather than coming here after he's voted in, in April, rather than coming for two weeks, leaving for a month, come back for a month, leave for three weeks, we want him fully engaged and his earliest start time is August. So that's why there's that time gap, if that makes sense. Okay. Committee, I miss anything? Great. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. For what it's worth, I was hounding. <laughs> I didn't know he'd applied, but I was hounding the, the, the search committee members. If Dave Kiefer hasn't applied, you need to go headhunt him. Because if I, if I could pick one person on the planet, it would be Dave. And lo and behold, he's great. Okay, sorry, I have announcements. <laughs> uh, I have a, a decent amount, and also check your, check your bulletin because quite a few of the announcements are in there as well. First, uh, Women's Friday Night Fellowship event is March 22nd. That's coming up at six, from 6 to 8 p.m. It's a potluck dinner. Sign up in the Narthex. Uh, Kingdom Kids leaders are needed. Uh, the deadline to sign up for that is the end of the month, with, which is uh, March 31st, Easter. So if we don't have leaders, we will not be able to do Kingdom Kids. So please consider whether you can sign up uh, this year for that. And as was mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, there is a silent auction fundraiser to benefit the Labs Adoption Fund, and that starts today in the Narthex. Uh, the, the bidding starts today. It will continue. Um, and, you know, bid early, bid often, uh, bid high. Uh, any checks that should be made, make them out to RPC, and then have it say Adoption and Child Care Fund, not the name of where it's going for, I don't remember why, but it's important. So do it, do it that way. Uh, say Adoption Fund. Uh, if you're making a monetary donation, uh, there will be envelopes in the auction if you want to do that, or by the auction if you want to do that directly. Uh, there is an RPC workday coming up March 23rd. Uh, we need to spruce the place up. So let Jeremy Labs know if you can come um, and if you have any skills to offer. And if you don't, they still want you to come. But you'll learn skills, so that'll be great. Okay, and then uh, please... Please invite someone to our Easter service. That's coming up soon. Invitations are in the back of the sanctuary and in the narthex. And Easter is a lot like Christmas in that there's some people that will come that won't come other times. It's a great time to hear the gospel, hear the good news, and be reminded of that or maybe told for the first time. Uh, and lastly, please uh, stay for Sunday school. The adult classes are Isaiah on the third floor and then God, Technology, and the Christian Life in room 212. With that, you are dismissed. Have a great Lord's Day.